Well, it's time to talk about the best fantasy race there is, the Skaven. And no, it's not any of us, it's the Skaven. Before you say anything, does your race use a fantasy version of uranium to create weapons with incredibly silly results and have the most ridiculous political system in the world? No? Well, it's not the best then, is it? But yes, I love the Rat Men. Been playing them since 6th edition. But today we're going to look at their first proper army book in 4th edition fantasy. Still, for those who don't know, who the hell are the Skaven? Well, they are a race of mutant rat men about the size of a human and are absolutely everywhere in fantasy. Still, not many people know about them, as they live in their underground under-empire that covers almost the entire other world and even has some connections to Lustria and even other places. The Skaven are ruled by the Council of Thirteen, based in the capital of Skaven Blight and consists of many clans, the main ones being the Plague Monks of Clan Pestilence, the Warlock Engineers of Clan Skyre, the Assassin Adepts of Clan Eshin, and the Mutated War Beasts of Clan Mulder. They are numerous, with their numbers being in the millions, and when they go to war, the enemies are usually drowned in the sheer numbers the Skaven produce. They do this all in the name of their god, the Horned Rat, who is actually a lesser Chaos God in the setting. Still, Skaven society is... not one you expect to live long in. This is because they're the most backstabbing, double-crossing and dishonorable race in the entire goddamn setting. The Skaven are their own worst enemy, to the point you could have multiple clans or warlords move on the same objective and they could easily wipe it out, but then they proceed to betray and backstab each other to ensure they are the ones who claim victory, and it all falls apart. Heck, the one time they actually worked together was during the end times, and they did incredibly well. Honestly though, this is what makes them kind of fun, as has a bit of slapstick comedy about it in some reigns, and as she knows they get up to. That and their technology and magic is incredibly powerful, but they have never seen a health and safety officer in their lives. This is mainly because they use Warpstone, which their race uses for currency, ammo, actual weapons, and pretty much everything else. Now, seeing as Warpstone is a solid form of pure chaos, this obviously has some drawbacks. Like, say you're using a normal machine. It goes wrong, it just breaks, or worst case, explodes and kills the crew. Now, for Skaven, while the war machine is more powerful, when it goes wrong, well... The enemy might see a big green mushroom cloud, and then raining Skaven body parts from the mini nuclear explosion that just occurred. But yeah, that's your simple explanation of the Skaven. Now, before we move on to the army, let's talk about their magics, magic items, and army rules. Well, army rules rise is pretty simple in 4th, as they had one universal one, which stayed around for quite a while, which was for every rank or five or more Skaven in a unit, they got plus one to the leadership to a max of ten, due to the strength in numbers making them all confident. Yeah, quite handy, as other than that, the highest leadership they had was... seven outside of some special characters on the Vermin Lord. So yeah, Skaven didn't have deep ranks, and I'll be honest, as a Skaven player, 40 model units, 5 models wide, was not uncommon to field for quite a while. Now, onto their magic items, and they had a nice selection of unique ones. First up, Warpstone Armor. A very nice piece of armor that was 50 points for a plus armor save that Rusus could wear without it hindering their magical abilities. Still, if a character was hit, for every successful save, they did a strength free hit on the attacker. A nice bonus. They also had the Warpstone Amulet, and enemies in base to base contact with the rare and stop combat phase had to pass the leadership test, and if they failed, they'd have minus 2 strength and minus 2 to hear their hit rolls for that round of combat. 25 points for a decent debuff. Now, the next one is a Wizard's only item, the Seer Stone, for 35 points. This let the wizards use extra power cards during the magic phase to increase the range of the spells by d6 inches for each card. It was okay, but yeah, the d6 meant it wasn't reliable, so kind of unbranded for Skaven. Next up, the Fell Blade, which is what was used to deal with the gash, and price wise, yeah, 135 points. Still, it does make the rarer strength 10 and do d6 runes for each rune, so worth it. Though it has the downside of the end of every Skaven turn, you had to roll a dice, and on a 6, the rarer took a wound of no armor saves allowed. Another weapon is the Dwarf Gouger. No guesses what it was used against. This is 50 points, and has a minus 3 save modifier, and does 2 wounds instead of 1. 
If he was on dwarves, he also always wins on 2 plus, so yeah, handy against them in the high toughness. Now, if you're a Plague Monk character, you can have the Rod of Corruption for 100 points. This is a hand to hand weapon, but if it hits the target, they must immediately take a toughness test, and if they fail, they die and end up a pile of rotted flesh and excrement. No armor can protect you against this unless it was magical. If they pass the toughness test, you just roll to ruined like normal. Now, meanwhile, for the Skaven Assassins, they can take the Cloak of Shadows for 75 points. This made the Assassin hard to see and target, and if you wanted to shoot or charge it, you'd need to roll a 5 plus first to do so, otherwise had to change target. Now, for a Magic Banner, they had the Sacred Standard of the Horned Rat for 75 points. It had two abilities. The first, it made the owner and the unit they were in, Leadership 10, very helpful for Skaven. The second, if a spell is cast against the owner and the unit, they absorb the power cards used on a 4+, and the Skaven can use them in their magic phase as well. The spell effect would still go through though if not dispelled, so it was not actual protection. Next up, the brew known as Skull. For 50 points, this just fully healed the wielder. Pretty standard for a healing potion, but good. Now, Poison Ring Gloves next, and these were a ranged weapon for 25 points. These had an 8 inch range and a 2 inch blast, and you roll the scatter dice, and the hit, stay put, otherwise it would scatter d3 inches. Any model covered would take a wound on a 4 plus with no armor saves allowed. Short range, but against cavalry and other heavy armor, but go through the armor nicely. Back to play monks again, with the Leave of Ugolinus for 75 points. This made the rarer act as a level 2 wizard, and they would generate 2 spells randomly, from 4 Skaven spells, being Putrefy, Plague, Pestilent Breath and River, or three Nurgle spells, Steam of Corruption, Miasma of Pestilence, or Stench of Nurgle. Nice variety. Now, can I interest you in some Skaven Brew for 50 points? At the start of battle, you rolled, and this was given to the unit and character. On a one, nothing happens. Two to three, they now have hatred against all non-Skaven. Never a bad thing. For the five, they are now frenzied, which is okay, but you'd rather have the hatred, honestly. And on a 6, um, the unit's move and attacks are doubled, but at the end of the Skaven turn you had to roll dice, on the 1 they took d6 wounds as the um, crew had some nasty side effects. Next up, the two-handed weapon Storm Reman was a 25 point halberd that could cast Warp Lightning, though you had to roll after each use, and the War 2 it was exhausted. This was also exclusive to Warlocks. Still, all Skaven Wizards could use the Warp Storm Scroll, which was 50 points, and was a one-time use item that forced all units flying high so they would return to the ground on their table edge, but also take d6 strength 6 hits. Considering Skaven didn't really use flyers, but some very specific monsters, this was kind of beneficial. Next up, another one-use item is the Brass Orb for 50 points. This was thrown like a poison ring globe, but all models under had to roll equal or under the initiative, or be sucked in the realm of chaos. A 6 was always a fail, and at the start of each following magic phase, you roll the scatter dice and artillery dice. It would then teleport to that location, and anything under the template would then have to test again, or it disappeared if you rolled a misfire. So yeah, it could deal some good damage, and then possibly move on to your own forces. Oh well, it's given tech for you. Finally, the bands of power for 40 points. This was an item with three uses, which during the magic phase doubled the rarest strength to the next magic phase. Yeah, pretty fine. So yes, some interesting magic items, most of which would stay around in some form later on, but now onto the magic. Now, the Skaven would dealt spells and power cards as normal, but they also had Warp Stone. So, at the start of the game, a Warlock Engineer would generate D3-2, a Warlock Champion, D3-1, a Warlock Master, D3, and a Grey Seer, D3-1 Warp Stone tokens. Now, when casting a spell, you could choose to use one or more of the Warpstone tokens to count as a power card. This sounds good as, hey, you can cast a lot more spells, but you then needed to do a warp test after each use. You rolled a d6 and the result was more than the Warpstone, the wizard was fine. If equal to or lower, so a one would always be a fail, then they became a Chaos Spawn. Whoops. Now, while you did have some control of the Chaos Spawn, it did make the wizard count as being destroyed. 
So, had to be a bit careful with your warp stone. Maybe, hopefully, only eat one instead of going all three. Also, this might be a me thing, but I tend to have green skittles or something similar to an eat to represent them as... Yeah, that's how to get the powers by eating them. No wonder they turn to chaos spawns. Sheesh. Now, they had 13 spells because... Skaven love the number 13. 10 of which could be used by any of their wizards, but 3 were unique to Great Seers. First up, Warp Lightning. This had a power level of 2 and a 24 inch range, and did D6 strength 5 hits to the target the model had line of sight to, with no armor saves allowed. Though again, pretty good against cavalry and heavy armor. Next up, Crack's Call. This was also a power level 2 and an 18 inch range, and you measured a straight line from the caster, and if being touched by the line, had to pass an initiative test or fall to the death. War Machines, Chariots, and other such things fell down the hole in the 5 plus, since they didn't have an initiative. Next up, Scorch. This was power level 1, had a 24 inch range, and all models of the unit were wounded on the 6 plus. No save modifier or anything. Also, if in, say, a forest, it caught fire. Anything in the terrain at the end of the movement phase would take a strength 3 hit, and you then roll a die. On a 1 or 2, it went out. 3 to 4, it kept burning. 5 to 6, it spread to another piece of flammable terrain within 6 inches if possible. Mmm. Poison Wind next up, and this was a power level 3 spell with a 24 inch range. You placed its special template on the unit, and every model under it on a 5 plus would take D6 wounds, no armor saves allowed. Ouch. And yes, this is individual models. So, hmm. Skitter Leap was power level 1. And the character or single model within 3 inches goes anywhere they want on the battlefield, even into close combat, counting as charging. This does mean you could technically use the magic to lob a doom wheel or something into combat, which is kind of funny. Now, who wants a good old-fashioned plague? Well, it was power level 3 and had 18 inches range. You choose a model, and it takes 2d6 minus its toughness wounds with no armor saves allowed. So, if it was toughest 3 to roll a 9, it takes 6. If the victim dies, it moves to another model within 4 inches, and keeps going till someone survives it. This was easily of capable of gutting a unit if you rolled well enough, and, well, you need potentially a whole army if they were clustered together. Mm. Next up, Pestilent Breath. This was a power level 1 breath attack, and any models it touched were wounded on the 4+, plus with no saves allowed, bar magic armor. Next up, Vermintide. And this was power level 2, and it had a 3d6 range. Now, this had its own template, and moved 3d6 inches away from the caster in a straight line. Each model it went over took a strength 3 hit, with a minus 1 save modifier. The template would also remain in play and keep moving 3d6 inches each following magic phase until it was dispelled or went off the table. Next up, River, which does d6 strength 6 hits to an enemy, which... but only if they were in base contact with the model. This also had no armor saves, but magic ones were allowed. Pretty decent for a power level 1 spell. Next, Putrefy is also a power level 1 spell with a 24 inch range. It was used on an enemy that was in close combat, and they had to pass the leadership test. If they failed, they immediately broke. But if they passed, the suffer minus one to hit the next round of combat, so good result either way. Now we're going to move on to the three Bracia ones. First up, Madness. This had a power level of 2 and a range of 24 inches, and you targeted a single model. Both the Skaven player and the model's owner roll a d6, and if the Skaven player wins, they control the model the next turn. This lasts until the spell is dispelled, or the following enemy turn they roll off again. This was powerful, so you can see why it was limited to just Grey Seers, as imagine spamming this with a Warlock. Another Grey Sphere only spell was Death Frenzy. This was power level 3, and you chose a friendly unit within 6 inches, and they got double movement and attacks, but must also always charge as they can. Still, they suffered d6 wounds at the end of each following magic phase till it was dispelled or cancelled by the caster. And finally, we had a spell that had incredibly potential power. Curse of the Horned Rat was power level 3, range 12, and unique to the Grey Seers as well. You rolled 2d6 for each model in the unit, and if it was over the toughest of that model, they would turn to a clan rat, even characters. 
the models that were created this way were treated as a new clan rat unit. So yeah, kill enemies and turn them into clan rats was quite powerful. And that was their equipment and magic. Next time we're going to look into the army composition of the Skaven and their characters. See you then.